Hello loves, Dark Side back again with another video. This is going to be part two of my Dark Side Goes to Jail series. And hopefully you guys like this. I think it's pretty cool. Get to share some real life experiences with you. Alright, so we're gonna pick up where we left off. I was at the substation. Um just getting done with being interviewed by the jail detective or the detective there. And uh, now it's time for me to go to the county jail. Okay, so well, the whole most heartbreaking part about this right here was as they were putting me back in handcuffs to transport me to the county jail, my phone was ringing on the detective's desk, and it was my family calling, wanting to know where I was at because I didn't home yet. And this dinner, I was supposed to be going back to dinner with my family, and this, now it's like four or five hours later, it's like nine or ten o'clock at night. You know, and uh, now I, I'm, I'm screwed. I'm done. Uh, I don't know what my bond's gonna be yet, but I do know what my charges are. And uh, so now uh, they put me in the back of the cop car. And my jail, my county jail, is about 40 minutes drive south of where I'm at. Like, remember, I'm all the way at the top of the, of the county, northwest top of the county, almost to the county above me. My jail, where I was at, where I was gonna be at, was like all the way at the bottom southeast corner of my county like two miles away from the county below me. okay so it was gonna be a long haul there man and, uh, it was really depressing and I wasn't crying or nothing but I just felt so heartbroken man and I was just so so devastated by all of it and I couldn't believe it couldn't believe I did this and I was like I just felt really bad man you know let my family down everything but so then the uh the cop in the in the in driving me because they put me and my girlfriend in separate vehicles because now we're co-defendants now and they don't want you to collaborate any stories they want to make sure that you, they get different answers from both of you and see who's lying things like that they're, they're, they're never going to put us together again so basically uh the cop that was driving me down there was blasting the radio and i'm like sir can you please turn that down i just wanted to have my thoughts to myself. And what does he do? He's an asshole. He turns the fucking radio all the way up. And I'm like, what so I just kind of blocked it out and was thinking about everything. And it's really uncomfortable in the back of the cop car because it's plastic. You're sitting on plastic. There's no cushion, nothing in the back. They have drains in the bottom of the, of, you know, the floorboards and everything. That's in case somebody pisses on themselves. Somebody, you know, you know, whatever. They might spit all over the place. They might throw up. They're drunk. You never know. So that's why they do that. But so finally we get to the county jail <clears throat> they call it in to the county jail and they say I right, got one coming for intake and they pull into this little garage and basically what it is is this this rolling fence that rolls up it rolls up and then the car pulls in and then it rolls down behind you and it pulls you in so you never escape it's impossible um, and basically for those of you that want to know what it looks like if you've ever done the uh, the Cayo Perico setups when you do the demolition setups that kind of rolling gate at the O'Neill's ranch or whatever in their house that's what exactly what it looks like but the gate kind of like that it rolls up and down all right so uh now um finally they they have the uh the county corrections people come out because now you're they're turning you over to the corrections depart department of the county and they come out and they kind of lift you out of the car and pull you out and, and they help gain your balance and they get you out because you can't get out of the cop car because you have no way to get out you know, they, they tell you to put your feet out first and they get you out. And then they bring you inside and they sit you down in a chair. And now what they do now is uh, they tell you, look, you know, uh, there's a sign up there and they say, look, um, any contraband must be, you know, you must get rid of any contraband of any kind at this point. This is your last chance to get rid of any type of contraband. And what contraband is, is like cigarettes, drugs, uh, weapons, any outside food or drink or anything like that. Anything that's not allowed to be in jail, you have to get rid of it. Okay, and there's a sign there that tells you that. So now, if you happen to have contraband on you, and you're inside the county jail, and they find, like, you know, you're hiding cigarettes or drugs or whatever, they can hit you with an outside charge, an additional charge, and what that's called is introduction of contraband into a jail facility. And that could be a felony. So you can get even more time besides the, the uh, you know, whatever you've been booked in so far, okay? Or whatever you're charged with so far, they can add another charge on to you. So you don't want to do that. All right, so they also sit you down, they take your, your belt and your shoelaces. And a couple reasons why they do that is because they don't want you to, you know, like I said, jail is a very depressing, harrowing experience. It's tra very traumatic for a lot of people. Like it was for me, you know, because I, I wasn't expecting to be there for months. And uh, 
you know, they, they want to make sure you're not doing anything stupid. Like, they want to make sure you don't try and kill yourself or hurt someone else, hurt any of the jail employees, all that stuff. So they take your shoelaces and your belt, things like that. They take all that from you, okay? And uh, after that, then they bring you into the holding cell. You go through the metal detector, they bring you into the holding cell, and you have to sit there for, like, hours. A jail is a long and very, very boring process being booked into the county jail. And eventually... After a few hours, they will call you out, and you'll go see medical, the medical people. They come, a nurse comes, they talk to you, they ask you if you have any thoughts of hurting yourself, do you have any wounds, maybe you were in a fight, a bar fight, whatever the case is, and they get you medical attention or whatever. If you feel like you're, you're going to harm yourself or somebody else, they have the psych people come and talk to you, and then they, you know, they might put you in like a, uh, a solitary cell or whatever, like what they call solitary confinement. Or, or you know, but you're by yourself, and they have to monitor you, and and they do checks on you, like mental health checks. That every 15 minutes, they gotta come and check on you, make sure you're okay, you know, and check your cell, and make sure you're there, and you're not hanging yourself or something crazy. So, but that's if you you know feel like you're gonna harm yourself or something like that. And that that's a whole other story. I'll get into that later on too. But anyway, now you're waiting back in the cell, and in the cell, this big cell, this holding cell, there might be up to 20 people in there. And there's only one little toilet, metal toilet, and it has a little, uh, a little hollowed out sink up on top. You push the button for the cold water, same for the hot water, but usually the hot water never works. It's just the way it goes. And, um, and you have to basically do your business in front of everybody, okay? You have to piss in front of everyone, you have to shit in front of everyone. They give you a, they have a, a big roll of toilet paper. Sometimes, some places, some jails have a little wall there for privacy. But the front of it's open, and they can look in if they want to see you doing whatever. And, you know, it gives you a little bit of privacy, but some places don't. Um, which really, really sucks. It's very embarrassing. You know, it's very dehumanizing and humiliating to have to do that in front of other people. I mean, it really, really is. So now, next, uh, you get back. <clears throat> you're in the holding cell still, and they finally call you out to do your profile stuff. Like, your fingerprints. Um pictures, all that stuff. And now, once you take your fingerprints, you've been, you know, booked with a felony, that that goes everywhere. They, they put it in this database called NCIC. It's National Criminal, I can't remember the rest of it. But this goes countywide, statewide, nationwide, worldwide, like Interpol knows, everybody knows that you've been not necessarily convicted of a felony, but you've been in trouble for some kind of felony. And you've been arrested for that, okay? So, just because you weren't convicted of it, it's still going to be in there, okay? And then now they also do something called the DNA swab. Where they come and they swab your mouth with a cotton ball, like a cotton swab thing, and they put it in a jar and they send it off to the lab. And now you're officially in the system as a convicted felon. Like, there's no way around it. You, your, your, your DNA is in the system. And, uh, yes, it, it sucks. So if you did a crime maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they had fingerprints, but they didn't, couldn't, couldn't match up to anybody, and you might have got arrested again, they matched the fingerprints to, the, you know, to what would happen 15 years ago, you're going to get in trouble for that. You know what I mean? So now, now they got your ass. So you go back to that, you go back into the cell again, and you hang out again, and you just wait. It's all, jail is all waiting when you're being booked. It's waiting, waiting, waiting. Again. Now you come out once again. And they call you out, and now you're going to go speak to what they call a classification officer. And now, they determine where you're going to be hot housed. They tell you what your bond is, they tell you how, mu how much your bond is, uh, if you have no bond. Um, they want to know if you have any enemies in the jail. They want to know, because maybe you're in a gang or something like that. They want to know that they can put you in a, 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 what do you call it, a housing unit with the same gang, or different gang, or whatever the, whatever the case may be. Maybe you had somebody, you were locked up once there before and you had a problem with somebody. You know, they want to know all that stuff. They want to know if you've ever, you know, been in the gang or been to jail before. They, they ask you a whole bunch of questions, okay? And then they tell you what your bond is. Okay, so my bond when I went in was $25,000. So it's going to be twenty-five hundred. dollars they, they require 10% to get out. And you have to do that through what they call a bonds, bail bonds. And you have to basically own something $25,000 or more in order for collateral. So this way the bondsman knows he's not going to get screwed. So you can put the first 10% down with the bondsman. And the bondsman, basically his insurance company, fronts up the rest of the money to the courts and everything and to, to the you know county. 
and, and they say, all right, we're gonna take care of this bond. And then once you make all your core dates and everything, once you've paid off your 10%, they give you, they, they release you from that debt of the 25,000 basically. So you're good to go. So, or you can roll the dice and if you've been booked into the jail before midnight, you can go the next following morning to what they call first appearance, where you have to go before a judge. Everyone has a first appearance, no matter who you are, unless you bond out ahead of time. Um, now, if the judge, if you've been arrested before, say you were arrested six months ago and the, and the judge saw you and said, if you come before me again, I'm gonna either off, no bond you rather, or not offer you a bond at all, then they could strip it from you. He could strip it from you, or he can even raise it to double it. They could do it, it's up to their discretion. They're not supposed to be able to do that, but they can do it. I've seen judges do it before. Um, but, you know, it just all depends on if he's seen you and he's pissed off at you, and he's seen you in there before a few times. They could decide to give you no bond, and you're stuck in there. So sometimes you're better off bonding out, but he lowered mine to $15,000, so it was only $1,500 for me to get out. And, uh, you know, he dropped mine down ten grand. So, and, uh, but yeah, so that's, we're going to pick up next time with part three. I'm going to let you guys know what it's like when I found that I wasn't going to be going home and, uh, couldn't get a hold of my family. And finally, uh, I'm going to be coming, be becoming a resident of the jail, getting my bracelet and everything, dressing me in what they call dressing you. And I'm going to let you guys know about that in part three. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. A uh, little series that I'm bringing to you. This is all real stuff that's happened to me. I'm not making none of this up. This is all true shit. Um, I have no reason to lie about it. You know, I mean, this is all real, real stuff. I'm taking you step by step what it's like getting locked up. So I don't want anybody else to have to go through this nonsense. So, all right, guys. Hopefully, you have a good weekend. Uh, I'll see you in a few days. Peace.